Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today we are going to take a final look at the early revision Amiga 500 I made a couple of videos about. I'm going to take another look at the power supply and see if I can resolve the issue. I also decided to replace the floppy disk drive again with one that's more period correct because I wasn't quite satisfied with the one I put in there in one of the last videos. And then I'm going to wrap the video up with some more Amiga archaeology, some historical research helped by some emails and comments I got from you. So let's go! The first step is going to be a look at this power supply that I kind of reworked and did some troubleshooting on and I couldn't quite figure out what's wrong with it. It actually powered uh, all the Amiga 500s I tried with it fine, except for the one it is supposed to power, which is the early Revision 3 Amiga 500 that we looked at. I'm going to take another look at this. Uh, the first step is going to be kind of reverting this to mostly its original state. I replaced the capacitors. I kind of replaced one capacitor with the original one again. I'm going to put the new one in again and uh, then I'm going to also put another switching transistor in the one that was originally in here to have this in a state that's as original as possible and then I'm going to take a look at why this actually doesn't power our Rev3 Amiga 500. Reverting this to kind of original with new capacitors, that's the thing. And there we go, that's all reverted. I have the original transistor back in there and I put the new capacitor that I had in this last time in there. And in order to test the power supply properly, I'm going to have to open up the Amiga 500 again. Just want to give it a quick test run uh, in case something went wrong while I stored it for several months now, I believe procrastinated doing this. So I'm just going to uh, quickly fire this up on a known good power supply and see if we still get it to start up, which we do. That's a good sign. Uh, We're going to take a look at the power supply in question that came with this. I'm not sure if it's the power supply this originally shipped with, but it is an early 1987 one. So I'm going to open this up again to actually see what the voltages look like on the board in the Amiga with the power supply that wasn't quite powering this. And just as a little reminder, this still says serial number 190 on the sticker here. So it is still the early Revision 3 Amiga 500 that I'm working on, that I've done several videos about now. There we go. And we're also going to have to remove the keyboard. And yeah, I am going to replace the disk drive with a more period correct one, I think. If only for the more accurate sound. <laughs> keyboard goes to the side and the shielding shall be removed. So I think there's several spots where we can actually see the voltages as they arrive on the board. One theory that people in the comments had is that the diameter of the pins on this power connector is not compatible with this uh, power connector. It should be the DIN standard, so 
basically there's no way these are not complying to the, that standard and also the uh, socket. But maybe it got worn out and something doesn't make good contact. So it is a good idea obviously to check the voltages on board and not the voltages uh, on another Amiga board. So that might rule out that fault. I already cleaned the plug a bit more and tried to scrape off the pins a bit with a screwdriver. Uh, I'm going to do the same with the power socket on here and maybe that even fixes it. Maybe it's just bad contact. And I'm going to put the power supply into the bottom case at least to make it a bit safer. Let's put the top case on here. Okay, let's try this. Turning on the power. And we get absolutely nothing. We don't get any response from this. Let's double check with another Amiga, I think, before I ruin this one. So, set up my Amiga 600 now, which uses the exact same connector and voltages. And there the power light comes on and... Do we get anything working here? Yeah, the disk is booting up. So the power supply actually seems to work still. That was uh, kind of what we were at in the last power supply fixing attempt video. So yeah, this is the power supply in question and it does power this Amiga 600, which is even upgraded and uh, has a CF card in it or an SD card actually, I believe, and an accelerator card. So it powers that fine even. So it doesn't power for some reason my standard Amiga 500. It does power other Amiga 500s fine. I'm just going to see if we get the correct voltages on the Amiga board. So the Amiga 500 in question, with the power supply in question, I'm just going to measure some voltages. So it seems we can measure the voltages quite conveniently at these capacitors that are directly behind the power socket here. So uh, we have all three voltages which are plus 5 volts, plus 12 volts and minus 12 volts on the solder joints that are facing the connector and also on the solder joints on the other side obviously and those should be the voltages that actually go into the board so i'm taking my ground point here this is 0.002 with the power supply activated this is minus 13 and this is plus 10 or thereabouts Hmm, let's look at these with the other power supply. <laughs> so exactly the same setup, but with the other power supply. The Amiga boots up actually at this point. So that's our five volt rail. That's how it should look. That's on the rightmost capacitor there. That's our minus 12. And that's our plus 12. So the plus 12 is low and the plus five is super low with our power supply that we're looking at. For whatever reason, and that's the 5 volt rail is so low that it doesn't even make sense that any Amiga would power up with that. So we indeed might have an issue with the connector here, which is unfortunate. So maybe our connector is a bit wonky. We have, this is the power supply, the old power supply. I don't know if it's visible on camera, but this is the one that worked, the right hand one. And that actually has, the pins look a bit bigger, a bit thicker than the ones on the one that doesn't work. So maybe it's just a matter of that, I'm not sure. Hmm. Yeah, it's either that or something is pulling both of those rails low. I'm not sure why it would work with the other power supply, although that's a more modern switching power supply. Oh, a good idea would be to test for continuity between the cable and the power supply. I plugged it in. Multimeter set to continuity testing. And then off we go. The pins for these outputs are actually labeled on the board. So we're going to have to see if we make continuity. Okay, we have continuity on the 5 volt. This is ground, I think. Yep. This should be one of the others. Yep. These should be 
we have continuity on all of these, I think. So it's still the power supply that's giving me trouble. Or something in the Amiga. It's not the connector. Not sure, the power supply seems to be a bit weak for some reason, still. So we ruled out the connector and uh, the plug. Those make perfectly good contact, uh, but the voltages are still drawn low. No idea what causes this to pull down the 5 volt rail and the 12 volt rail. The 12 volt value 10.4 or whatever we had should be perfectly fine, I think. It's nothing to worry too much about on the load. But the 5 volt rail was at point something volts, so that's definitely not enough to power this, obviously, as we've seen. And yeah, I don't know what pulls that low, especially since this works absolutely no problem with other power supplies. Yeah, as usual, if you have any ideas, put them in the comments. I think I'm going to leave it at that at this point because I am definitely out of ideas. There might be something that draws a lot more current than the other Amigas that I've tried. I've tried different uh, models of A500s. I tried my A600. Yeah, basically all the Amigas that I have that have this connector I tried and all of them worked fine with this power supply except for the one that it came with. That's kind of, I don't know, something's wrong with this, but I don't know what. So we have around 70 ohms between ground and our 5 volt rail, which is relatively low. It's like 67 or something measured between ground and the 5 volt input. On the other inputs, it's way higher than that in the mega ohms. But the 5 volt rail is what powers most of, of the system, so it is to be expected that that value is lower. I don't know if that is uh, too low. It's not like it's shorted out or anything like that. I'm going to double check on another Amiga 500, I think. So this is my Amiga 500 test board, and on this one, the resistance is around 130 ohms and the other voltage rails do have something in the kilo ohms so i don't think around 70 ohms is it is a bit low but also this is a revision 5 board and not a revision 3 so it seems like the 5 volt rail just requires more juice on the ref 3 that might be the whole explanation but that wouldn't explain why this power supply powers other Amigas that are should be more power hungry. I, th I think at this point I'm just going to give up on the power supply because the power supply is not the important bit, I think. I guess the Amiga is fine. It did work with everything I threw at it and the power supply is not so important. Yeah, as I said, I'm out of ideas for a bit. It might be that the uh, 67, 68 ohms that we saw between ground and the 5 volt rail are too low. But then again, on the Rev 5 board, uh, that is a broken board <laughs> actually, but the power supply should work fine, this, the power supply section. And that's, I, I think, double as much roughly than what we've seen on the Amiga Rev 3. So I'm not sure what would cause that. It's not shorted out or anything, so it shouldn't pull down the 5 volt rail that much. I'm not sure. If you have any ideas, you are welcome to post them in the comments. I think I'm going to close the case on the power supply quite literally and move on because it's really not worth it. It's, uh, it doesn't look great. So yeah, I'm sorry, but that's it for the power supply, at least for me. I was hoping for a cable issue or a connector issue here, but obviously that's not the case. So the power supply goes back into its case and I am going to write some thorough documentation about what I found. And then maybe somebody somewhere, wherever this Amiga is going to end up, has an idea about how to fix this. It was definitely worth a try. And at least it looks a bit uh, brighter than it was. It looked like a block of cheese. <laughs> Just wanted to quickly check this without the disk drive connected. Uh, yeah, this is now completely disconnected. 
yeah, that's now at 75, 76 ohms. Uh, still much lower than on the Revision 5 board, but I don't think this is a huge problem usually. So yeah, as I said, I'm still out of ideas. That was my last idea because some of these more modern drives are powered by 5 volt and I believe this one is as well. As it also says on the label here, 0.7 amps at 5 volts is the power source for this, whereas the original drives that were built into these Amigas have a 12 volt supply for the motors and a 5 volt supply for the logic in here. And these more modern ones use 5 volt motors. I am going to remove this completely anyway, so I'm going to put an original Amiga 500 drive into this. I've also given up on the drive that was in here originally because I couldn't align it to an extent that it actually worked reliably. I am however going to put a more accurate drive in here, more period correct drive, because this just strikes me as a kind of blasphemous. <laughs> so that's that disk drive removed again because I had second thoughts on that. The disk drive I'm going to use is currently sitting in my Checkmate case here. That at least is a real Amiga 500 disk drive. So I'm going to extract this from here. And the modern drive uh, is more suitable for this build, I think. This is an Amiga 500 drive from, from 1991. So it is quite a bit uh, younger than the original drive that was in the Rev3 Amiga, but it's still far more accurate than what we had. And this one is also a known good one that was recapped and lubricated and cleaned by myself, unlike the drive I just bought off eBay. So this feels way more comfortable to put it in the Rev3 Amiga. Just feels way better. And this one lost its eject button. So I'm going to have to reattach that. These things have little plastic tabs that always break off. I think I repaired this at some point with some epoxy, but then I glued the whole thing to the disk drive. But the same thing is actually true for this drive, which the uh, seller of these uh, just glued these buttons to them as well. So I'm going to mix up some epoxy and glue this button back on after removing the residue. So this is an original Amiga eject button as well. So that's going to look more original than the other one that was slightly off color wise. So I just went with some super glue and yeah, it actually works pretty well. I'm going to uh, leave this to settle for a bit more, but we should be fine, I guess. So let's put this into the Amiga and see if it actually works after letting this settle for a bit more. Here's the date code, by the way, third week or eighth week, I'm not quite sure, of 91. And this is a Chinon Chinon Drive FB354. As usual with these uh, Amigas from the 90s at least, they used these very much in the Amigas, in the Amiga 500s of that era. It's also recapped and lubricated and cleaned, which makes this a good choice, I think. I'm also going to transplant the original standoffs from the original drive that was in the Amiga to this drive to keep it as original as possible. And this is also the exact same dimensions as the original drive, so less to worry about adapters and things like that. And the connectors are also in different spots, so uh, this is on the other side compared to the new drive I put in there, which is this one. So this one has the connector on the left from this angle and this one on the right, so the uh, floppy disk drive connector. This one has the connector also to the right, but uh, they're closer together. So yeah, it's all different, but the drive I'm going to put in there is going to fit better than this one, at least. And the uh, connector is upside down on the newer PC drive which also was an issue. And into the Amiga it goes. Yeah, that's more like it. There we go. 
that looks more like an Amiga drive. And we also can just angle this cable like so. Ah, it looks way better. Let's see if it works. The drive is ticking. And it sounds much more accurate than the drive that was in here before. Uh, so, a bit more nostalgic. And it also boots Turrican, which is kind of my marginal test disc. But this drive uh, was working really well in the Checkmate case, so it's, it's a working drive. And it looks a bit more original, and it also sounds a bit more original than the replacement one we had in there. This is going to stay in here, I think. That's the way I want to do this. And also, the routing of the cables is a bit less stressful for the cables. <laughs> yeah, this drive seems to work. That's good. And it even seems that we can now start the Tarikin 2 disc that Stefan sent me with this Amiga. Yeah, it boots up fine. So this drive works better in that regard, at least, than the one we had in there previously, where this didn't quite start up. So I'm happy with this, I think, and I'm going to close this up again and put the keyboard back in and close the case. But first, let's talk about some of the archaeological findings that uh, you contributed. In this final part of the video, before I close the Amiga up again, I am going to try to correctly place this in the history of the Amiga 500. I still believe this is a very, very early one, judging by the date codes on the chips, uh, which are all from early 1987. So 7th week of 87 is what most of the original chips that are in here say. And that is very early in production of the Amiga 500. However, it is difficult to correctly date this because Commodore, the company who made these, is famous for just using everything they have in their inventory to build these machines. So there are machines that have the Revision 3 mainboard that were produced a lot later than this one. There are also machines with the Revision 5 mainboard, which is the su successor to the Revision 3. Are you confused yet? <laughs> that were produced very close in time to this one and sold. At that point in time, in 1987, Commodore also ran several factories around the world where they, they produced the computers. Things might have gotten mixed up during the process, during the life of this machine, and uh, the machine itself seems to be in its original state, from all I can tell. So the case uh, is the original one, the chips are all the original ones, the PCB, of course, is the original one. The date codes on the chips are original. The serial numbers seem to be original. We had a batch with the serial number 16 on the PCB, which points to this being a really, really early production model. We had the, I think, uh, 190 on the case batch. They don't match up. That's normal for Amiga 500s. So we have a very early Amiga 500. And in fact, it seems to be the earliest one that we have pictures of the serial numbers of in the community so far. I got several emails and comments on the video of people who have uh, similarly early Amiga 500 models and I'm just going to present them in a way so that maybe things come together and make sense and we can clear up some of the discussion points and myths around the early Amiga 500 models. There is this very famous picture of Jeff Porter, who is one of the original creators of the Amiga 500, and he's holding an early Amiga 500 here in this picture, which he claims to be serial number one, the first Amiga 500 that ever left a factory. It is pretty interesting in that it has the case badge, like the one we have here, which also points to the cases with the batch versus the slightly newer cases with the embossed logos. These ones are the original first run Amiga 500 cases. 
We can also see that the keyboard is the exact same that we have here with the Commodore key instead of the second Amiga key and with the solid Amiga key in the right position. Also the caps lock LED seems to be a bit larger. So this is definitely a chicken lips keyboard just like the one we have on the Amiga we are looking at in this series. That's allegedly the first Amiga 500 that ever left the factory and was sold or not sold, Jeff Porter kept it, is I think the story. So there's been a lot of discussion about which case model is the first one and I think this is another hint to the actual ones with the badge are the first production models of the Amiga 500. I got some other emails. There's one from Felix Rios who has a very old Amiga 500 as well and the chips on his are from similar date codes. He presented me with some pictures of his mainboard and the date codes on his are actually from the fifth week of 87 and the 45th week of 86. The processor here. Many of these chips were produced earlier than the ones that we had. And he also has a ceramic chip in there on U41, which is the these graphics chips and that's from 20th week of 86. I don't know if these are the original chips that were in there, but the serial number doesn't even have the serial number sticker that we had on our Amiga, just has some handwritten logos, which is pretty interesting. It says it's been built February 10th, uh, 87 on this number 16, which is the same serial number that ours had. So I don't know if this, if they started labeling them with proper serial stickers, after that even only. It's pretty unclear because Commodore, as I said, has a history of uh, being pretty bad with documentation and with throwing stuff together. Yeah, we have another ceramic, which are usually the older chips, another ceramic chip here, which I think is the Paula chip actually the sound chip so that's really early as well. So these chips are from late 86 and some of them are from 87 as you can see on the Agnes chip on top there which maybe points to the fact that these uh, chips have been replaced during the life of the Amiga. It's also a revision 3 mainboard, which in any case is the first revision that was released of the Amiga 500. We had another email from Marcin Kopka and he has a very early Amiga 500 as well. This is serial number 538 on the case badge and it also has the logo badge on the case, which actually points to this being the original Amiga 500, the first one. This is also a Revision 3 mainboard, which has uh, very similar date codes to what I had here, seventh week of 87. So this is very much the same as what I had. Interestingly, there's a slight difference regarding the timing circuitry in this. In the bottom left corner there, you can see the silk screen saying Y1, and that is where on the Rev3 Amiga that we are looking at, there is the crystal that is responsible for the timings in the system, the general clock, system clock. Whereas on my version here, the X1 position that is slightly above that, close to the processor and the kickstart ROM, that is not populated on mine, but it is on this one with a quartz oscillator. So that is a different approach, but they have both footprints for these. And as far as I can tell, they probably used the crystal, the Y1 position for the earlier models and then very quickly switched to using an oscillator because that was probably more stable and maybe cheaper. <laughs> Knowing Commodore's history, they mostly went with the cheapest option that was available. This already has plastic packaging for the chips, for all the custom chips, unlike the one we saw previously. And yeah, Y1 was never populated, it seems which is interesting. It also has the little capacitors on the keyboard, which is also one of the high-tech 
Space Invaders keyboard like on the model we are looking at. And the date code is also from late 86 like on the one we are looking at. The drive that they built in is a Chinon or Chinon drive unlike the one we had and otherwise it looks very similar. This is a much higher serial number on the board, 2993, and it seems to have been produced in week 1387, whereas uh, the one we were looking at had the badge saying 12th week of 87. So they are very close in time, but also quite different. So it seems they produced quite a few in the initial runs, but still, I think the one we were looking at is an earlier one than this everything points to it even though the date codes on the chips which they had probably had many more of than they had amigas then they just populated the boards that were running off the production line in the different factories which is pretty interesting i found particularly interesting is the oscillator versus the crystal in the different positions there with two machines being that close in history I got a couple of comments and emails and things like that as well and just wanted to tell you about some of them. One email that I got was from Justin Mitchell who runs the Breadbox YouTube channel and uh, the Commodore Computer Museum down in New Zealand. He actually wrote me that interestingly Commodore computers in New Zealand in the 80s got the first 10 Amiga 500s that were ever produced. I'm not sure if that is true that's just his claim and he actually was in touch with Commodore Computers New Zealand at the time and allegedly they didn't do anything special with them they just sold them in stores in the distribution network. Justin actually managed to get number six of the original 10 that were shipped to New Zealand. There are some hints that some of the very first Amigas were shipped all across the globe. Commodore had uh, distribution centers everywhere basically at that point. They were really successful in the uh, 80s. So they had a huge network and they had independent Commodore centers all over the world. So this might be very well true. It might be that the first 10 ever produced Amiga 500s ended up in New Zealand. We don't know. And it's all hearsay basically. I can't really uh, fact check these things because it's just anecdotes that you sent me. Vintage Technologies commented on the original video in this series that he bought his first Amiga 500 in 1988 and he got one with the high-tech keyboard, with the Space Invaders keybo keyboard, which is pretty interesting because at that point usually Amigas had the cost-reduced keyboards, uh, but he got one with a chicken lips Space Invaders with the little Commodore key and it had a Revision 5 mainboard in it, but he doesn't remember of the serial number or anything like that. I think that proves the point again that Commodore often used whatever they had in their inventory and just put parts together to make working machines no matter what. That's a classic Commodore for you. There's many 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 examples of that being at work, that mindset. They are also famous for refurbishing like uh, returned units to make them work and then sell them again as new machines basically. So sometimes weird combinations of cases and uh, motherboards and uh, other components turned up. That's pretty usual for Commodore stuff. Timothy. Timothy also commented that he bought an Amiga 500 in New Zealand, in, interestingly, in late 87. And that seems to have been built in the 26th week of 1987, according to the badges. Serial number HB4001208. Externally identical to the one we were looking at, so it has the Space Invaders keyboard. But it already had a Revision 5 motherboard, which is also the same motherboard that my Amiga 500 that I originally had has that has a revision 5. So Commodore made the change from revision 3 to revision 5 mainboards really quickly because uh, the revision 3 was a bit flawed in places. It worked pretty well but it had a couple of flaws. That's pretty interesting as well. I also got a comment from Federico Paschi. I hope I'm not butchering uh, all your names. I'm not sure. Uh, he bought an Amiga in Italy in August 1987. It had the Chicken Lips keyboard and it had the Commodore logo button. It had an American keyboard layout, but it had a Revision 5 mainboard in it already, I believe. 
So that is pretty much also proof that Commodore used up the chicken lips keyboards, which I, by the way, found evidence that there were localized versions of that even, but the initial ones that were sold seem to have all been uh, American standard keyboard layout. There were German layout uh, chicken lips keyboard later on. I've seen pictures of those that were not looking like they were photoshopped in any way. Got another comment from Rhett Anderson who had serial number 31, which he remembers is because it was 11111 in binary. <laughs> and that was a computer that was sent to Compute Magazine for review. And uh, Red was an assistant editor for Compute's Gazette. And he asked his features editor, Selby Bateman at the time, if Commodore would let the, him buy the Amiga instead of sending it back. And they did. So it ended up in his possession. And it was the computer Red used when working on the book Mapping the Amiga, which is pretty well known, at least to people back in the day, I believe. So that was also a very early chicken and loops keyboard Amiga number 31 that is actually existed and it still remembered which serial number it had. And that was the review unit so probably it makes sense that they would send out the very first units for review. I also got a comment from Necronome. My Amiga 500 is from week 20 on the yellow sticker on the PCB and has the exact same Commodore key high-tech keyboard dated 8707, so seventh week of 87, but without the little caps on the keyboard chip, which is interesting because it's slightly later than the date code on my keyboard chip or the one in the Amiga I'm looking at. It's not my Amiga, still not mine. My case is also like yours with the molded info and just the serial number on the sticker. He his has serial number 38165 and the molded Commodore logo on the case. So that's slightly later than this and they already seem to have used the molded Commodore logo on the case in that one. So I'm not sure what to make of all this. As I said, it's super difficult to exactly date things except for the date codes on the chips, which I believe are the best hint at least when the chips were produced, they don't really give a hint to when the unit was put together by Commodore and actually sold. So I still believe everything points to this Amiga 500 being one of the earliest out there, still alive or alive again after I fixed it now. And as I said repeatedly, I did my best to try and keep its museum value as it is just doing very slight, very careful restoration work and repair work as we've seen throughout the whole series. So the only thing left to do in this series, for me at least, is to put this back together and wrap it up carefully and then it should go to some kind of museum. And that's also something I want the community to decide basically. If you run a computer museum or if you have any ideas where to send this to, the owner of this, Stefan, wants this to be in a museum where it can be used actually and marveled at and appreciated for what it is. An early, very, very early Amiga 500, maybe the earliest that is still alive, we don't know. So if you have any ideas about that, where this should end up, please let me know in the comments. I'm going to close it up carefully, put it all back together, wrap it up very carefully. I'm going to write some documentation to go with it, which will include everything I did. I'm also going to include links to the videos I posted and things like that for full documentation. I'm going to include all the parts that I replaced. The broken parts are all going to be included in the package with this Amiga 500. Uh, so if somebody is able to fix the disk drive, the original one that was in here, it is going to be doable with the stuff I provide. So that's it for this Amiga 500. I hope I could clear up some things. Above all, I think the case batch discussion should be settled. I think these cases with the badges with the slightly bolder print on the Commodore logo than later cases which again had a badge, they are the earliest production cases for the Amiga 500. Everything points to that and all the reports I got from very early Amiga 500s, all the really early ones had those kinds of cases. Slightly later they changed that to the embossed logo cases and then they changed it back sometime later to the batch cases but with a thinner printed Commodore logo. So taking one final look at the innards of this Amiga and placing the shielding back on here, bending the tabs.
this drive still works. Okay, time to put the screws back in one last time. And there we go. One very early Amiga 500 back together, working again, well documented, hopefully, and hopefully ending up in a museum where you can touch this and play with it. I did the best with my restoration skills to bring this back to its original look and functionality. I hope nobody was disappointed. That's it, I think. Goodbye, Amiga Rev3. You're going to leave my little lab here and go into the world. I'm just going to play some Turrican 2 on this to do some final testing now. <laughs> and then I'm going to wrap it up quite literally and see where it's going. At this point, I'm super happy that I got this to its original state, pretty much. I'm super happy with the result and I hope somebody is going to enjoy this in a museum in the future and appreciate the work that went into the Amiga designing it and also maybe my work fixing and refurbishing it. Thank you very much for your support on Patreon and on the channel memberships page and also on Ko-fi and also for your comments and your emails that I got regarding the early Amiga 500s. Much appreciated. Thanks for your thumbs and your subscriptions here on YouTube and elsewhere. Thanks for watching. I'm Jan Beta. See you next time. Bye!